The Unshackled Waves, episode 208. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. It's less than two weeks until Christmas, but of course, Australian politics is the beast that never sleeps. The Morrison government finally released the erotic review into religious freedom in Australia and announced the drafting of a new Religious Discrimination Act and a new Freedom of Religion Commissioner at the Australian Human Rights Commission. Labor has just held their national conference where on-stage protests against offshore processing of asylum seekers and the Adani coal mine were not enough to have these policies included in Labor's national platform. Leader Bill Shorten also outlined several big government policy announcements during his speech. Also, the Greens Party meltdown continues where it has gone nuclear in New South Wales with environmental moderates in the party want the far-left communist and anarchists expelled. First, I will bring in political editor of The Unshackled, Michael Smythe, to review the political week and then bring in new associate editor, editor of The Unshackled, Lucas Rosas, to discuss the Greens as it's his area of expertise. Both guests will be audio only this week, but now let's bring in Michael. Michael, welcome back again. Thank you, Tim. Now, the Morrison government finally released the Religious Freedom Review, uh, chaired by former Attorney General in the Howard government, uh, Philip Ruddick, along with uh, 15,000 submissions. Now, this uh, inquiry review was, for, uh, was authorised in the wake of uh, same-sex marriage becoming law in Australia. It had been presented to then Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull in March, but had sat in a desk uh, since then, but then was selectively leaked during the Wentworth by-election. Uh, that, that's when it came out that uh, the recommendation that if uh, religious schools are going to uh, discriminate against gay students, it should be outlined in a uh, official policy. Now that set off a political firestorm where uh, the Morrison government pledged to pass legislation to protect gay students at religious schools. However, uh, negotiations between the government and Labor uh, broke down and that was in the final week of Parliament and then we had this announcement this week. Now, they've adopted 15 of the 20 recommendations in the review and what they, Scott Morrison announced with Attorney General Christian Porter is that uh, the government would enact a Religious Discrimination Act, describing it as the missing link in discrimination law. Uh, laws protecting gay students and teachers at religious schools will now be going to an Australian Law Reform uh, Commission consideration. And also they want a Freedom of Religion Commissioner in the Australian Human Rights uh, Commission. There's going to be no blasphemy law or 18C for religion. But in my opinion, it's still a massive reversal in conservative attitude to discrimination law. I remember in, in 2013, the Institute of Public Affairs said that we should get rid of uh, anti-discrimination law and the Human Rights Commission altogether. Yet, uh, Senator James Patterson, who used to work at the IPA, he's been one of the strongest voices for this Religious Discrimination Act. Mm, mm. Yeah, it's kind of concerning. Um, actually, it's all kind of concerning. I mean, notwithstanding the fact that you've got the leaks that are coming out rather conveniently during the Wentworth by-election, I won't say who is to blame for that, but those of you who know me well enough will know who I would be pointing the finger at where I asked. The problem is this. Of course, no one should... Of course, your school shouldn't be discriminating against students based on their sexuality of course not but what but if your parents have enrolled you and i've said this in an earlier episode i'm pretty sure if your parents have enrolled you in a school that has an ethos which says such and such is wrong and they are acting out such and such then you know what? They're not part of the ethos. It's a private institution. This is the libertarian argument. It's a pri private institution has the right to 
include or exclude whomever it pleases simply because it's not a state institution obviously they the receive yeah they receive commonwealth money uh, and from uh, the the federal government these uh, religious schools and this was the argument put forward by Andrew Bolt who was one of the the conservatives who came out strongly against religious schools having the power to expel gay students saying well if they do that they shouldn't accept uh, one or uh, be entitled to one cent of of taxpayer money yes but the thing with Bolt is that he, and this is interesting that Bolt mentions this, because the consensus uh, in terms of Parliament authorising the government to give some money, not much, but some money to private schools, especially religious-owned or religious-run private schools, was actually Menzies, but it was, was actually under Menzies, but it was done as a way of healing the sectarian divide that existed between Protestants and Catholics in the first half first half of the 20th century. I mean, there was a lot of anti-Catholic bias in Australia at that time. I mean, it still exists today, but it's much more subtle than it is, than it was, rather, back then. Um, look, the... The argument back then was probably valid. I'd actually say, to be honest, I don't think private schools should be getting any funding from the government simply because of the fact that, well, they are private institutions. They are getting their own... They're raising money themselves. They can raise money themselves. They shouldn't be um, receiving money from the government unless they absolutely need it. And the thing is, if they absolutely need that money, then they shouldn't be operating that institution, that school in the first place. As hardline and as libertarian of me as that sounds, it's just not feasible. I mean, I mean, how would you feel if you had your money going to an organization that runs contrary to your ethos or that does not like your own ethos oh wait we have the human rights commission i'm sorry my bad carry on ah oh, i was not saying that that's a valid enough argument i was just saying that that is the the argument put forward by people like andrew bolt but uh, the, i would prefer the government uh, federal government not give any organization money directly as a libertarian i favor a school voucher system where the the, uh, the the federal government gives a set amount to each parent to choose to send their child to the the school that they see fit uh, for their child's education so yeah it's but we we get into this back and forth about oh uh, who whose school is it uh, who's allowed to receive uh, government must uh, money but we're getting quiet we're going back to this uh, religious schools argument which was only one aspect of uh, this uh, religious freedom review um, but yeah going back to my point that uh, the fact that we're going to have another discrimination act which seems to be that conservatives have said well every other group has its discrimination act and human rights commissioner uh, of religious people they should they should have one as well it's basically well we've already got this uh, legal apparatus up so we'll most will make it uh, equally uh, apply to, to everyone which is it's it's kind of a defeatist mindset uh, mindset to take mm. well it is pandering to the liberalism of identity politics isn't it so and that's a huge that's a huge um downside of it i mean you know me i consider myself somewhat of a traditionalist so i'm very I'm very hostile to the excesses of liberalism. I've said it before, but I'll say it again. The idea that a private institution should be forced to employ people who are in breach of the ethos of the employing inst of the employer is pr extremely problematic, if not outright wrong. And it's just, no, I, I, I won't ever support something like that. Now, at this stage, yeah, I should probably be clear here, at this stage, it doesn't seem 
that it's going to have an impact on the students, but it does seem that one of the potential outcomes, however, and I have to choose my words very carefully here, is that there's some teachers who are walking a fine line between not living the ethos and outright breaking it might decide to vexatiously litigate just for uh, just to make a point of their own in their minds. Now, to mention Andrew Bold again, and for that matter, Paul Murray, the the Sky After Dark uh, conservative lineup, uh, they've rightly pointed out, in my opinion, that this Religious Discrimination Act will just open up a whole new bunch of legal lawfare that we've already seen with uh, other aspects of discrimination laws that, well, even though there is no 18C uh, provision, that's that's not going to stop a lot of uh, complaints because it'll be unlawful to discriminate on the grounds of religion. And there'll be a lot of people who want to want to claim, well, I was discriminated against in, in this setting and that. And you can imagine the, the, the business that the Human Rights Commission uh, will get. And there's also concern that a Religious Discrimination Act could protect archaic uh, Muslim practices or ones that aren't compatible with uh, Australian values. And now the Attorney General Christian Porter has said that, oh, there'd be all these uh, exemptions where uh, you could discriminate and, and say that, no, that's not religious freedom, which begs the question, why are you putting out this Religious Discrimination Act in the first place? Is it just a big virtue signal to, to people who uh, didn't like same-sex marriage? Because that's sort of what it was in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Now, that's an interesting point, actually. Could those laws protect, could such laws protect archaic Muslim practice? In theory, yes, they could. The only way you'd be able to make it so that these protections for Christian schools would not apply to Muslim schools, for example. Yes, no one's asked them what they out. think of gay teachers or students. It's because they don't usually employ them, Tim. Mm. The, 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 the question doesn't come up when they employ teachers. They don't ask, oh, by the way, are you gay? Because even if they were, they would say no because they want the job. The other thing that could be used to, um, and, and you're right, Tim, it, it is virtue signaling. It's a lot of virtue signaling that this whole Religious Discrimination Act calls on. And, you know, it's barely better than, you know, the Victorian Religious Vilification Act. They tried Danny Nalia and Daniel Scott under yeah, and the Bendigo Three, uh, Blair Cottrell, Neil Erickson, and uh, Christopher, Christopher Shortest. Shortest yeah. yeah, the Racial and Religious Tolerance Act. Toleration Act. Yeah, so, that's right. Ugh. Wait, wait. They actually tried to get the Bendigo Three under that same act. Yeah, they were charged under that act. I wonder if they've actually charged anyone for slighting Hinduism or Buddhism or or Catholicism or any other religion for that matter. And it's just, is it just me or is it just Islam that they're, pers that they're yeah. you know, or the, anyone uh, criticizing Islam gets dragged before that kangaroo court called VCAT? Yeah, I'm sure that there's some uh, artist in the, in the past 15 years since the act has been in place who's done a Piss Christ uh, exhibition. Now, uh, mm. of course, you know, free society should be able to do that, but it's interesting that that's never been taken to, uh, n no one's ever complained and taken that to court that that's re uh, religious vilification exactly it should be a statute of limitations i suppose but you know that's just that that piss christ thing is just absolutely offensive and i think to myself i feel like going saint nicholas on that asshole <laughs> you know what i mean mm. it's just you know i mean you criticize aspects of the faith you don't criticize the god or the deity of a religion that's just it, it's quite it's it, it's tenuous to do that i mean even if you are correct to do so it's still tenuous to do that the thing was the pastors 
Nalia and Scott, they weren't criticizing Allah. They weren't mocking Allah. They were just pointing out all of the problems in the Quran in terms of culture, what it actually teaches, carte blanche to violence against non-Muslims rather than the prescribed and very limited violence of the Old Testament. But that's an entirely different conversation for another time. I guess what, at the end of the day, what it comes down to in regards to this so-called Religious Discrimination Act, Tim, is that it can be used or misused and abused by whomever it wishes to do so. It's it's just, it's just it's another law that's right for abuse yeah. as far as i'm concerned and you know imagine what labor's going to do because even though this is proposed by a conservative government i mean labor uh, i i've seen a meme floating around today saying that oh, uh, the coalition passes the religious discrimination act and then in 2019 uh prime minister bill shorten uh, um, uh appoints yasmin abdel Magid as religious freedom commissioner <sighs> so yeah be careful what you yeah. wish for and and so it's uh, this is what libertarians always argue that you might think that a big government uh, proposal when you're in power is a really good idea, but you've always got to think, what will the other side do when they eventually get back in with it? <laughs> exactly. The pendulum always swings back and forth, Tim, and people have a tendency to forget this, both authoritarians and libertarians alike, mind you. These laws could have been changed in 2013 before Gillard got rolled by Rudd. Instead, she extended the exemptions and protections and now the Labour Party is going to accuse the left and the Labour Party are going to accuse ScoMo and the Liberal Party of being insensitive and heartless. Those are the words I'm looking for. They're going to accuse them of that. Hypocrisy. Thy name is Labour. Yeah. It's you, appalling. You have to remember that when Gillard was Prime Minister, she tried to make up for her atheism by saying that, oh, I'm really pro-religion and religious freedom. And well, she was going to address the, the Australian Christian Lobby Conference, but then their then managing director, Jim Wallace, made some comments about um, being gay, being as bad as smoking, and then she uh, got spooked. Wow, I forgot about those comments. Yeah, he's um, our Jim, he's not very subtle, is he? <laughs> I don't blame her for pulling out of that one bit. I would have too. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm a. I, I could like to consider myself as somewhat devout in my Christianity, but even I would have pulled out after comments like that. Well, you're a devout smoker too. <laughs> <laughs> for now, for now, but mm -hmm. that's another that's another discussion for another time. Now, Labour has said, of course, we support religious freedom, but we're waiting to see the legislation uh, be drafted. And uh, there's been this announcement, yet no uh, legislation has been proposed, which is always typical with a lot of announceables. And let's remember that uh, Parliament is only sitting eight days before the when we believe the, the next federal election will be. So whether it'll actually get time to be debated in Parliament, let alone past the parliament i mean um <laughs> i doubt it mm, i don't believe it will be either i mean it usually takes three or four weeks to get a bill through if you're lucky now labor had their national conference uh, this weekend and everyone uh was looking out for the the far left of the Labour Party who want uh, uh, the party to, in their words, be more compassionate to refugees. This means that um, removing the part in the ALP national platform, platform which binds MPs uh, on boat, boat turnbacks, uh, getting rid of that. And so therefore, Bill Shorten as Prime Minister couldn't turn back the, the boats and also to increase the refugee intake. Now, we saw Bill Shorten's address interrupted by uh, pro-refugee protesters who s 
put tape over their mouths and cross their arms and had to be dragged off stage. And then there was a guy who came up and also gave uh, Bill Shorten a stop uh, the Adani coal mine sign, which uh, Shorten took and he's like, oh, thanks for having your, your say. Now, these idiot leftist activists, I mean, it's, it's a gift to the Morrison government. I would say a small gift. I mean, it's just a minor e embarrassment and just shows how... Uh, the modern Labour Party has been so captured by the, the far left. But I think uh, given that deals were done by the factions to stop uh, both of these policy positions being adopted in the national platform had been done behind the scenes, there was just going to be these stunts. They make the news for a day and conservatives say, oh, look at the, the Labour uh, Party there. They've gone so far left. But everyone would just forget about it in, what, 24 hours time and Bill Shorten, there was an Ipsos, Ipsos poll uh, just released that showed Labor's 54-46 ahead. It's still going to be Prime Minister Bill Shorten. I mean, he's he's basically Teflon Bill. There's nothing he can do really now to stuff this up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the Turnbull I'm going to call it Turnbull Light. My, actually, that's probably a little bit unfair. I should probably start that over again. <clears throat> I've said it before and I'll say it again. Nobody can save the Liberal Party. No one. Not ScoMo. Definitely not Turnbull. Not Abbott. Even if John Howard and Peter Costello came back into the House of Representatives, they still could not save the Liberal Party. Only God can save the Liberal Party now. <laughs> They've lost. They've just squandered too much of their political capital. Abbott squandered all the political capital and goodwill that he had in the first couple of years. Turnbull squandered all of his goodwill in one year. And then it was just a matter of get rid of him. How long, oh Lord, please get rid of him. And then just to spite everyone, he decided to put in Scott Morrison, who, to be fair, isn't the worst prime minister we've had, but, you know, he's, he still can't win. He still can't save the... Um, he still can't save the Liberal Party from being pretty much smacked down like the hand of God... smacked down by the hand of God, so to speak. It's... Yeah. It's, it, although, although, in fairness... If they do keep this up, if the Labour Party does keep up with this, you know, lefty infighting, it'll be a lot closer than a 2007-esque victory, put it that way. Now, uh, Bill Shorten also used the opportunity to unveil some new policies, and they were pretty big government ones. If We, we were just discussing in the previous segment that... Uh, the coalition seems to have uh, embraced uh, some big government and uh, uh, what, uh, what you would say uh, over anti-freedom laws, but yeah, get set for what Labor's got coming. They want to build 250,000 new affordable homes for low-income working families. Uh, they also want, now, even though they've got rid of negative gearing, they want to give investors building new properties a subsidy of 8500 a year, but on the condition they keep rent at 20% low, the, the market rate of oh, the libertarian in me just wants to rage against rent control. It's just, I can't believe that this basic economic law <laughs> is, is, is about to be basically the Labor government, incoming Labor government, is going to try and bend it. It's just astonishing. Now, they want to make also superannuation part of the national employment standards because they believe that employers are hoarding uh, super payments that are entitled to workers. And they want a new environmental protection agency in case we haven't got enough environmental protection agencies and laws. And, of course, reaffirmed uh, their commitment to deliver 50% uh, more renewable energy uh, supply by 2030. First thing I should pick on, it is the, what was it? 20% as long as owners 
charge no more than 80% of rent. A $8,500 payment, uh, mm-hmm. as long as they keep uh, rent below 20% for the market rate. What a retarded fucking idea. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Let me, I should edit that part out because I want to I go on a legitimate rant about this. You're taking away negative gearing. You're planning to take away negative gearing so you can make more money, but you're giving it back to investors, the same people who are using your goddamned freaking negative gearing in the first place. It's just you're just creating churn. Yeah, and that's not even starting on the absolute stupidity. Oh, we'll give it to you if you keep your rent at twenty percent below the market rate. That's not how it works. That's not how the housing market works. That's not how the real estate market works. Even if you were to make it work like that, you can't. You just can't. Anyone who tries, the communists tried and failed miserably. Every socialist regime that has tried it has failed miserably. The only time you could possibly get rent controls at only 80% of the market rate is if you're doing through public housing, which we sort of do as it is now. But you can't expect investors to take on that risk. It's just not going to work. Now, mind you, I will say something this may surprise and even outrage some of you. I don't actually have an issue with Labor building 250,000 new affordable homes for low-income working families. I don't actually have an issue with that. What I have an issue with is the presumption as to where these places, where these new housing projects, these new ha- affordable homes are going to be built. Are they going to be built close to jobs where the jobs are available or are they going to be built in some isolated suburb well away from where the work actually is? So that's another question that has to be asked. Now, uh, what was the next one? that we were looking at, oh, new environmental protection agency and reaffirmed the commitment to deliver 50%, 50% more renewable energy by 2030. Okay, that's just stupid. It's not feasible. I'm sorry. I don't care how much money you throw at it, how much you advance technology. It's just not feasible in 12 years. Deal with it. All you're doing is creating more bureaucracy, more green tape to add on top of the red tape that is already killing and suffocating small businesses and entrepreneurs and mum and dads in this country. Oh, what was the final thing? Sorry, you said, did you say something about superannuation, Tim? Yeah. yeah. So superannuation being part of the national employment standards. Oh my God. Okay, don't get me wrong. I think that we don't... I, I think that given the lack of purchasing power purchasing power we could do with a wage increase but you're not going to pass on a real wage increase by making superannuation part of national employment standards it's just not going to work i mean how many businesses uh, are refusing to even start up because payroll tax superannuation energy bills everything just piling up all at once and they're just like no it's too hard i'd rather pay 30 odd cents in the dollar for my work than bust my guts break my back to try and make money and maybe get a few tax concessions which are being further clamped down due to red tape and green tape so yeah no i don't support any the uh well I did say the conditional support for, you know, 250,000 new affordable homes. But as for the rest, it's stupid. It's absolutely stupid and should be condemned. What's that mean that some fan of Futurama made? Your policies are bad and you should feel bad. They should feel bad. They should feel ashamed of themselves. They need to go back to university, learn economics, because the... The inner economist in me is triggered by the whole, oh, subsidy of eight and a half thousand a year after we get rid of negative gearing. It misses the point. I've already ranted on about it, so I won't do so again. But yeah, bro, I'm mad. 
I'm it's, really yeah. annoyed at that. It's just a, I mean, we've already said that Labour is going to win no, no matter what, but the fact that they can espouse these policies and the, the public are like, yeah, that's, you know, re re really good. It's just a shy sign that socialism is, and big government is back in, in fashion, especially amongst the young. I mean, the horrors of, of communism that we've know about and have learnt about and heard experiences about are long forgotten and there, there's this belief now that the the reason why society doesn't progress is because those evil rich people are hoarding it and bill shorten's coming in as a modern day robin hood saying i'm going to spread the spread the wealth except that's not how it works uh, but you and i know that but most people don't realize most people either have too short of mem too short memories to know or <laughs> or they just don't know. so so, blah, blah, blah. so sorry let me start that again i got my tongue tied there people either have their memories being too short or they never knew so they think that this is all there is. They don't have scope of understanding. They don't have critical analysis abilities. They just look at this and say, oh, grass is greener on the other side. Let's go to the grass being where the grass is greener. So they vote for those idiot socialists in the Labour Party. Well, if you can call them socialists, more like big government authoritarians who just love to spend your money and give it to other people. But you don't get any benefits, only, you know, minority groups who get it. Certain groups of people, you're trying to reverse the positions of the haves and the have-nots. That's what you're trying to do. All you're going to do is continue exacerbating class envy. So the, the very thing that the Labour Party exists to try and eradicate is the thing that perpetuates it constantly. The revolution is ongoing, comrade. So every time there is a new underdog, oh, we're gonna prof we're gonna prosper this new underdog over the previous underdog. That's what it goes, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. So I despise well, the Labour Party. Oh well, it sounds like we're definitely going to be called upon uh, in the next uh, several years to provide some economic lessons when things don't go to plan as of course we expect them not to but thanks for joining me for this uh, condensed uh, chat today uh, michael uh, we'll see if there's any more uh, australian political news over the the christmas and a new year break um, if there is i'll i'll have you back on but if we don't chat again uh, merry christmas and wishing you a very fruitful and exciting 2019 Merry Christmas to you too, Tim. And now it's time for his Unshackled Waves debut with newly appointed associate editor of The Unshackled, Lucas Roses. Now, this was recorded a few days ago, so my shirt is different, but hey, I don't pretend this is a live show, so deal with it. Lucas, welcome to your first appearance on The Unshackled Waves. Hello, Tim. Glad to be here. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. It's a nice day today, better than last week. Now, you're our resident expert on the regressive left in Australia, and you've done a couple of articles this week on the internal meltdown that's happening within the, the Greens party, but this has been happening throughout the year. So why don't we go back to the beginning, and probably the first sign that there was trouble in the Greens was the, the Batman by-election when uh, some in the Greens sabotaged the campaign of the Greens candidate for Batman, who was unsuccessful, Alex Patel, who was on actually a sixth attempt of the seat. Oh, yes. Good old Alex. Uh, she had a great time in that inner seat area. Anyone who doesn't know Melbourne well probably would be good to look up that particular area. It's a very idiosyncratic area. There's a reason why the Greens have targeted that area and why they've gone so strongly after it, in Alex's case, six times in a row. But because they've gone so strongly after it, they've put a lot of activists in that area and a lot of activists in that branch. The Darabin branch of the Greens is the largest branch in Australia, just in terms of numbers. 
and they've got a lot of people being put in there. And because there's a lot of people, there's also a lot of activists, and because there's a lot of activists, a lot of the people who originally started the branch, sort of the older, the cat ladies, the hippies, the, oh, uh, I just like trees and stuff, and let's try and smoke a joint full of granola, or something along those various lines. They have felt a bit pushed out, they had a bit of a complaint and a bit of a whinge, and they kicked up a stink about it by actually going to the Australian and from the evil News Corp empire, which was uh, I thought was quite funny in and of itself. But, uh, yeah, no, the problems with Alex there seem to be much more of a localised thing. The stuff that's come out this week is very much a New South Wales Greens problem, although they do seem to be having problems popping up all over the place. Well, it sounds like when the, the base expands it's a, as a double-edged sword, you get, you get the, the, the radicals in who uh, demand more. Yeah, pretty much. That's a big part of it. I mean, the New South Wales problem goes back to probably about late 2016 and that's when because the new south wales greens the greens parties in australia the various different state parties they all formed autonomously and then came together afterwards so they all have always had a particular sort of local character to them for instance the tasmanian greens have always been very different from the victorian greens have always been a bit more hipster and the western australian greens have always been more involved in the anti-nuclear movement and in a lot of more conservation style stuff a bit more hippie than, say, the New South Wales Greens, who grew out of the Green Bands movement and the um, the Builders Labourers Federation, and the sort of which itself was linked to the Australian Communist Party back in the day. So they've always had a more Marxist and anarchist and radical edge than New South Wales Greens. Now, what happened in 2016 is Left Renewal came out as an actual open faction, and that's always been a big no-no in the Greens. The Greens have never allowed journalists to actually come in and view their actual sort of internal workings, their conferences, that sort of stuff. They've tried to maintain see utmost secrecy about everything to do with, with anything that's even vaguely factional in their organisation. And so when they came out in 2016 and came out as a radical left faction, left renewal, openly saying that they were against capitalism and they wanted to smash it and that they were anarchists and platformists and socialists and that they were opposed to the more mainstream um, sections of the party. Well, that just put a huge cat amongst the pigeons. They were attacked by everyone. Bob Brown came out of retirement to attack them. So did Christine Milne. Richard Di Natale attacked them. All right, they were attacked over and over again by them, particularly the moderates in New South Wales, people like Jeremy Buckingham, whose name has come up very recently quite a bit, and people like Justin Fields as well. And this sort of struggle in between the two, it, it moved along. Um, over time, the more radical sections went and tried to get help outside the party. So they went to the Trotskyist group Solidarity, originally set up by Ian Rintoul of the Refugee Action Collective, and who's been a, a Marxist activist for decades. And they tried to use his help to get them an edge over their more moderate opponents. And what really came down to pretty much three big battles, right, which were between the, the left, uh, left renewal people and the more moderates. And the first one of these battles was uh, Lee Rhiannon. Now, in 2017, November 2017, uh, Lee Rhiannon was up for a pre-selection battle and the more moderate faction in New South Wales managed to kick her out. They managed to give her a big wallop and smashed her, even with all the help that she got from branch stacking, from groups like Solidarity, from the Trotskyists, all the help from Left Renewal, they couldn't help her. The moderates managed to, the more um, sort of hardcore moderate faction around Jeremy Buckingham managed to carve off enough of the middle voter in between the two that they actually swamped Lee Rhiannon. So I think it was 1,300 votes to 800 or something along those lines, a 60% win for a seat that she had held for quite some time. And that ended up going to Maureen Faruqi, um, Osman Faruqi's mum, a wonderful woman who gets up and speaks in Urdu about how terrible white people are in the Senate. So, uh, yeah, really big gain there. That's the moderate faction of the Greens. Nice one. The second um, big factional battle, a uh, big pre-selection battle happened in May of this year, and that was the one where you had Kate Fairman. Don't know if I'm pronouncing her name right. She I can't pronounce out. that. Yeah, I don't know what her name is, to be honest. She's blonde. She seems like a nice-looking lady. She's from the moderate faction. She likes hugging trees. Uh, she's along those lines. Uh, but um, she beat out um, Abigail. I forget her last name. Who Abigail was from the left faction, and she was from the more moderate faction, and managed to beat her out to take Faruqi's old seat, because Faruqi, of course, 
was moving into the Senate to take um, Rhiannon's seat. Now, the system in New South Wales is a staggered election. So you do the upper house is staggered every... Um, so you serve terms of eight years and it's re-elected. There's an election every four years for half of the upper house. So the Greens currently hold five seats in the upper house. Uh, but three of those seats come from a big bumper year that they had two elections ago. And the last election, they only got two seats, and it looks like what they're likely to get again. So the competition for those pre-selection spots, because the election will be held March next year, uh, in 2019, is humongous. It's gigantic. It is a huge, bloody, like, knives at the back, gigantic fight. And that, everything has to be seen in the context of that. Because when the pre-selections came up this year... Uh, it was in May, roughly around that time as well. The left wing has managed to actually pull off a coup. So they'd lost with Lee Rhiannon. They'd lost again, when trying to go over uh, the replacement for Maria Faruqi. And But when it came to the broader pre-selection for the 2019 election, they won. And this is where a lot of this sort of stuff started to explode. Because David Shoebridge, who, like Lee Rhiannon, has also spoken at um, Solidarity Conferences, so at Marxist Conferences, he's spoken at a couple of them, actually. He spoke both in 2017 and in 2018. So he has a long association with extremists. He also has been known to be associated, it was published in the Australian newspaper, known to be associated with the Socialist Alliance as well. He liked to joke about it, ha-ha, yeah, all my friends are communists. And um, he came up number one on the ticket. So he is number one on the ticket. He will be elected on the current Greens vote, on the current polling. Uh, and because the Greens um, policy is always to have two, uh, is always to have a, at least one woman in the top, two, that meant that the woman who scored highest was this Abigail, I wish I would remember her last name. She's not really much of a uh, an important figure, merely the fact that she's uh, from the left faction is the important part. So the left managed to clear out the top two um, spots in an election coming up where they're only likely to get two people, right? which meant that they completely blocked out the moderate faction, right? including Jeremy Buckingham, who even though he got the second highest amount of votes, was blocked out thanks to affirmative action, something which, of course, he would have supported if anyone had asked him, which is uh, quite ironic and nice and interesting. And that also pushed Dawn um, Walker, who is another moderate faction uh, MP, down to fourth position. So that's the background for all of these sexual assault sort of being allegations against Jeremy Buckingham being pushed out into the light. And then, of course, this week, uh, Kate Fairman, whatever her name is, and Justin Fields, who is a protege of Jeremy Buckingham, came out and declared with a lot of signatures on a petition that they've been circulating, uh, which includes three MPs, the Mayor of Byron Shire, and a whole bunch of councillors and ex-councillors and ex-members, a whole lot of people, for, particularly from the Greens parties in the hinterlands and the rural areas, in the more sort of hippie rural areas around Nimbin and around Byron Bay, uh, that they will leave the party, or at least that's the threat, if the radicals, the people from Solidarity, the people from Left Renewal, are not expelled. They're not made into a prescribed organisations. Even the Marxists and the anarchists aren't thrown out, their factional enemies aren't thrown out, then they will uh, leave or split the party or do something along those lines. Which is, um, it, it feels like a last throw of the dice. It feels like the, the left has actually managed after many, because uh, in the middle of uh, 2017, after Lee Rhiannon had, um, was desperately looking around and towards the end of 2017, after Lee Rhiannon had lost her pre-selection, it looks like this whole left renewal thing was a joke. It looks like uh, there were a lot of young um, anarchists in particular who were leaving, um, and socialists and Marxists as well. I think Greens uh, ended up, the young Greens in particular, but the Greens New South Wales ended up losing 200 members just in and around Sydney just during this period of time. It was... Uh, really looks like that the moderate faction under Buckingham had completely won. And then all these sexual assault allegations came out. And people like Faruqi, people like Jenny Leong, who made that uh, speech under parliamentary privilege, pretty much openly calling Jeremy Buckingham a, a rapist, um, they were more swayed over to the left side of the cause. And it's really just sort of been a huge turnaround. The New South Wales Greens might be about to flip to be far more extreme than they ever have been, if they don't 
respond to this petition that is uh, the due date for it is Monday. Yeah, for a party that is based on, as you said, so much secrecy for so many years, for Kate Farnham, she posted that on Facebook, which is a pretty public forum, and uh, airing out the, the party's dirty laundry for, for everyone to see and all the, the party's enemies. And yes, uh, these uh, sexual assault uh, allegations, not just against Buckingham, but there's also been uh, several in, in New South Wales. Uh, Jenny Leong, was she motivated more by factionalism or because she genuinely felt that Jeremy Buckingham could not stay? Well, she's traditionally been associated with the left, but she hasn't been like a full-on 100% showing up to Marxist meetings member of the left. Uh, so she's the sort of one, like left renewal as a faction always said that they wouldn't have any members who were MPs or representatives or anything like that. So they couldn't, it was always the get out of jail free card for people like Lee Rhiannon. They can always say, oh, I'm not a member of the left renewal. Of course not. I'm not allowed to be. I'm a senator. And she's not a senator anymore. So one wonders... But uh, yeah, Jenny Leong and her actions, I think, um, are a bit of a bit of a column A and a bit of column B. I think that there's really sort of a mixture there about what's been going on um, behind the scenes with her. Faruqi is a more interesting one because she only managed to get her Senate seat based off the moderate faction led by Buckingham's votes. And now she's turning around publicly calling for him to be thrown out. This is a bucket of crabs level of stuff here. And like you were saying, these people have been so secret since the 80s. These people have been so secret for so long. Uh, they have easily been the most secretive political party, minor or major, in all of Australia for over 25, perhaps even 30 years. And now this is all coming out. It's absolutely incredible. And it's really, really entertaining. And these uh, sexual assault allegations, they, they've formed part of the, the factional warfare, but they're actually quite serious. There was an ABC 730 segment back in August uh, speaking to, to many women who felt that the New South Wales party didn't take their allegations seriously. And then in the Victorian state election, there was one candidate who was uh, stood down uh, because of a rape allegation. There was another candidate who used to rap about uh, date rape. And there was also the, the former state leader, Greg Barber, who had to settle a sexual harassment uh, case and uh, called uh, female activists uh, fat, hairy, uh, legged uh, lesbians. Yeah. <laughs> Generally speaking, with the Greg Barber case, it's like there's definitely no smoke about fire. You don't pay out $54,000 54, to someone if you weren't doing any sort of uh, anything uh, nasty at all. All right, he was clearly a bit of a grub in the fact that he was the brother-in-law of Richard Di Natale, who was the party leader at the time, probably meant that he got away with uh, just having to quit rather than actually sort of uh, coming out anymore. And they just threw some hush money to make it go away. Like some of, you're right about some of these um, uh, allegations are absolutely horrific. I mean, this is the sort of stuff that, yeah, as I said in my article on it, any other um, party had done anything like this. I like definitely any party on the right, but even in the Labour Party, uh, there's no way that they'd be getting away with this to the level, uh, it would be flying under the radar to the level that it has been. Uh, this is absolutely, like, you, the one case of the uh, the journalist, who was a Greens-friendly journalist, surprise, right, in Sydney, and I, uh, she ended up being savagely, well, the accusation is, savagely raped by a man who then went on to work on three Greens campaigns, even while wow. the uh, allegations were being put, paid staff, not a volunteer, even while the allegations were being processed. And then eventually they met, put him on um, suspension and nothing else. No expulsion from the party for, like, you've, you've seen the pictures of the, um, that the alleged victim has, uh, she posted yeah, the up bruises. Online, and she... We won't say his name, but she did post his name because um, she felt the, the police weren't taking it seriously either. And it's like in some cases, you know, with um, sort of sexual assault allegations, you you tend to get a little bit sceptical, especially with all the Me Too stuff coming out. But my God, the bruises on this woman. It's just, it's horrific. I've seen domestic violence cases with less worse bruises than that. And that was supposed to be like, there's no way in hell you could possibly think that that was a consensual sexual action. It's um, it's absolutely horrific, and of course, it's 
unless you go digging around to the to their credit, the ABC did did cover it, right? But unless you go digging around on the ABC site, you don't even see those pictures. Uh, you don't see anything along these lines. It's like how it came out with the um, the things in the recent Victorian state election, all against the Greens. Right? It wasn't because of any sort of need to express the truth or to bring anything out like that. It's because the Greens were threatening three inner city Labor Party seats. And the Labor Party was feeding the journalists as many stories as they could possibly get their hands on. And you had Labor Party staffers doing all the background research for all these sorts of things. It's like uh, the Greens get away with murder, really. If you want to commit crimes in Australia, I suggest you join the Australian Greens. Well, thankfully, at the Victorian state election, uh, they were held accountable for that. Labor ran very hard against them, saying these are this is the party that claims to care about women. Look how look how they uh, behave. They lost four upper house seats. They they won one lower house seat, but lost uh, one. Uh, so, th and there was a proper level of scrutiny this time. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned the Bethel thing with the. Um the I think it's not in North the Batman, um, now known as Cooper because we can't have anything named after a white man anymore. Um, the Batman election that just came up the before um, I think that may have been the Greens peaking in Victoria. It's um, I really wouldn't think so. All the demographic changes, in particular the sort of centralisation and um, of sort of hipster lifestyle in and around those inner northern suburbs would suggest that they're very likely to be strong in those areas for the foreseeable future and that they might tip things a few more percentage points their way. But um, yeah, just considering the election, there was a, a massive slide to the Labor Party, but uh, the Greens didn't benefit at all from any movement to the left. Right, uh, and as much as they're now gloating about it, the Victorian Socialists didn't either. It was a Labor Party day. It really was. The uh, electorates were turned red. And there's a whole lot of room for analysis of that at another time. But the more interesting thing is what happening, what's going to happen on Monday with the New South Wales Yes. Press, right? Because if this bluff is called, and I suspect it probably will be, then the moderate fashion probably doesn't have all that many options left. And if they leave, that pushes the centre of gravity inside the New South Wales Greens massively to the left. And even if they bow under, uh, they'll have lost an awful lot of credibility. They're about to lose a couple of MPs. They will end up have, and the um, party will probably then go after, as you do when your opponent suddenly gets weaker, will go after Jeremy Buckingham, who's been like the linchpin for them for so long you are probably going to see a massive shift to the left in the um, in the New South Wales Greens party. And that is something that the left when you're all people when they came out in 2016. And the solidarity people from the Trotskyist groups that supported them the entire time through this, that was exactly what they planned. That is exactly what they wanted. That's what they hoped to achieve by coming out as an open faction. They've actually, if that happens on Monday and they don't get expelled, which I, I just simply can't see happening, then they've won. Uh, they've actually managed to achieve their goal. Uh, the same groups, calling themselves grassroots left greens, tried to do the same thing in Victoria and were crushed immediately by the party machine down in Victoria. Uh, but in New South Wales, they've had enough support and enough institutional support to actually build up a power base uh, to the point where they may actually be shifting the New South Wales Greens significantly further to the left towards outright Marxism and anarchism than anyone really thought possible. Well, I'm sure you'll be there to cover what happens in the New South Wales Greens on Monday. Uh, great work on your coverage to date, and it's good to finally chat with you on the show. Thank you very much, Tim. Have a good day. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. I'm pleased to announce the launch of the annual Unshackler Awards for 2018. We have 10 award categories with 10 nominees in each, with the winners announced on Australia Day by our senior editor, Damien Ferry. Voting is open for the Worst Australian Regressive and the Most Sought After Award, which is the Patriot of the Year, with more on the way. To cast your vote, go to theunshackled.net slash unshacklerawards. 
So you may be all aware of the Patreon purge that has occurred over the past week. This started with Miley Yiannopoulos being kicked off the platform for violating their community standards. Then YouTuber Sargon of Akkad was booted last weekend for using a racial slur on a live stream, uh, but this was taken out of context as justification for booting him off the platform. Of course, it is not just Patreon cutting off right-wing personalities' online income. PayPal has kicked off Alex Jones, Tommy Robinson, Blair Cottrell and the Proud Boys, and credit card uh, payment processor Stripe has also refused to facilitate payments to free speech social media platform Gab.ai. Those in the tech industry who believe in free speech are currently developing a payment processor that will not kowtow to leftist threats and boycotts, but currently you can still support us at Patreon at patreon.com slash the unshackled and directly via our paypal link paypal me slash the unshackled while you are still allowed to we are prepared for the day when we will fall afoul of these platforms so we now offer a premium membership option on our website which is the unshackled.net slash support options slash premium membership remember you can also support our work by buying some right thinking merchandise at uprightmarket.com so thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.